Did I hear uh, Alvin and Heidi Toppler? Did I hear uh, Lynn say that Newt was an anti-Semite tonight? Thought I did at about 7:30. I have to check the tape. The effective executive Peter F. Drucker. Leadership in the computer Mary E. Boone. Leadership in the computer Mary E. Boone. Working without a net, how to survive and thrive in today's high-risk business world. Uh, Morris R. Schechtman. But Newt is an anti-Semite. He recommends books by, by uh, Peter Drucker, by uh, Heidi Toffler, Alvin Toffler, and Morris Schechtman, but I heard him vilified as an anti-Semite. When did Lynn get so uh, sensitive to anti-Semitism? Oh, but uh, anyway, so much for that. Newt, his comments. And I know it's hard to believe, but we actually believe that a brain-dead Congress is a bad Congress. We think it's actually good to have ideas, and we think it's useful to have a party and a movement that is based on ideas. Now, I'd like to see the left, the hippie, punk, puke-faced left, getting itself branded down at CBGB's. I'd like to see them now characterize this man, ridicule him as an anti-intellectual. I'm not going to expand uh, on that today. All you've heard me talk about the concept of five major changes. There are two papers that, that'll be handed out that are going to be in the back. The freshmen have already gotten them both. One is on strategy from now through April. The other is on the scale of the change. It's a paper on the size of the transformation. We'll make it available to the press corps and any American who wants it. But the essence of it is that we together are going to go through five parallel changes. We're going to make a change into the third wave information age. We're going to make a change into the world market so we're the most competitive country in the world with the best jobs, with the highest take-home pay, and the greatest productivity. We're going to replace the welfare state with an opportunity society. And all of you have heard me talk about the notion that no society can survive, no civilization can survive, with 12-year-olds having babies, with 15-year-olds killing each other, with 17-year-olds dying of AIDS, with 18-year-olds getting diplomas they cannot read. We are going to genuinely take the steps to make that no longer a reality for all too many Americans. Does that sound like a, a harsh, dictatorial, fascist, uncaring? I think in addition, we have to recognize our commitment to renewing American civilization by reestablishing the reality that this is a multi-ethnic society, but it's one civilization. People come here to be Americans, and they want to be Americans, and that implies a civilization with a set of habits and patterns. And finally, and something which I learned campaigning in Tullahoma, Tennessee with Van Hillary at a meeting where people were totally committed, totally excited, and I suddenly realized they really wanted us to win so they could walk off and we would do it. And I changed my speech in mid-speech, and for me it was the most radical moment of the fall campaign. And I said, wait a minute. We're not going to change America in Washington, D.C. We're going to change America one individual at a time, one family at a time, one neighborhood at a time, one church or synagogue at a time. Oh, but I thought he's anti-Semitic. No. One voluntary organization at a time, one private business at a time, and then one local government, one school board, one city council, one state legislature. And yeah, the Congress and the president are going to have a role to play in all this, but we're not going to get through these changes if we think we can hire a bunch of professional bureaucrats, but ours will be smarter. If we think that our professional politicians hiding in rooms are better than the Democrats' professional politicians hiding in rooms. The only way that we can get through this is to be able to genuinely reach out and genuinely have a chance to have a dialogue with the American people. And I think it has to occur in two steps. And I hope every member is going to be determined. And I hope, frankly, the Democrats decide to join us. Is that a fascist? Is that an anti-Semite? Is that a dictator? Is that a mean-spirited man? This is a man who passionately cares about the common weal, the common welfare. This is a man who is a born leader. He knows where he's going. Can anybody have ever said that about Bill Clinton? Does this man, do you think Newt Gingrich can waffle? You think Newt Gingrich is gonna say, gee, uh, the tide of opinion has changed. I better, I better wrench myself to the left. No, I better scurry over here to the right. No, I better go up, I better go down, I better go over, I better go around. Newt Gingrich knows who he is. Bill Clinton doesn't, and frankly, I don't blame him. I wouldn't wanna know that person either. One is to have a discussion about definitions. When you see a person without money, are they victims or are they opportunities for a better future? Are they people to have caretaking or are they people who, in fact, if you care for them, you can give them a helping hand and change their lives? Which are we looking at? You hear what he says? Give them a helping hand and change their lives? Mean-spirited. 
When you see a large government bureaucracy, is it an inevitable relic of the past that cannot be changed, or is it an opportunity for an extraordinary transformation to provide better services and better opportunities at lower cost, exactly what every major corporation is going through? I want to close with two people, both of whom love freedom, and both of whom I think had a message for us. I want you to listen to this carefully, ladies and gentlemen. This is Newt Gingrich, the hater of, of Democrats, the scourge of America, the dictator, the fascist, the authoritarian, the anti-Semite. Listen to Newt Gingrich. I want to go back again to that day in March 1933, because I think you can, just as you can never study Washington too much, if you truly love democracy, and you truly believe in representative self-government, you can never study Franklin Delano Roosevelt too much. He did bring us out of the Depression. He did lead the Allied movement in World War II. In many ways, he created the modern world. He was clearly, I think, as a political leader, the greatest figure of the 20th century. This coming from the hated Newt Gingrich. Lauding, devoting panegyrics to FDR. And I think his concept that we have nothing to fear but fear itself, that we'll take an experiment. And if it fails, we'll do another one. And if you go back and read the New Deal, they tried again and again. They didn't always get it right, and we would have voted against much of it. But the truth is, we would have voted for much of it. And second, Winston Churchill, who in 1940, in the darkest and grimmest days, said, I have nothing to offer but blood, sweat, toil, and tears. This is not a guaranteed performance. This is not a guaranteed success. But if each of us every day will wake up committed to helping America, and if we will remember that the real success is in not a Republican re-election, the real success isn't even a balanced budget, the real success is no law, the real success is the morning we wake up on a Monday and no child has been killed anywhere in America that weekend. And every child is going to a school their parents think is worth attending. And across the country, there is a smaller, more customer-friendly government doing effectively what government should do. And every American has a chance to create a job or find a job. And across the planet, freedom is winning. And civility and decency are driving barbarism out of our lives. Then we will truly succeed. And if each of us will, on behalf of the American people, offer the best version we have of blood, sweat, toil, and tears, then together, I believe, the American people will, in fact, renew American civilization. Ladies and gentlemen, this man is a staggeringly huge giant. This man towers above his, above his hack critics, above the, the shrieking, caterwauling, hippie left who hate America and hate him because they sense his love for America. I ask you, is what I just read a vision of harshness, a vision of mean-spiritedness, a vision of autocracy, a vision of totalitarian authoritarianism? Or is this not a dream of a greater, more efficient, more ethical America for all Americans? Fight the lies. Read Newt Gingrich yourself. And don't listen to petty pseudo-commentators who don't know who they are, where they are, or what they are. On WABC Baseball season, yeah, well, the way things look now, oh, I don't know. Well, Scooter, I heard you signed a new contract, actually, with Picks. I read that in the paper Unbelievable, yesterday. Unbelievable, but uh, what they didn't tell you is I might have to be doing the St. Patrick's Day parade. <laughs> I got to do something for that contract. There may be no baseball. That's, that's I may end up playing again. I might be in uniform at the start of the season. <laughs> that's right. You try out. You'll be the best shortstop in New York. Anyway, Chase, Jay, before I even get to what I wanted to talk about, uh, let me uh, congratulate you for uh, all the nights of uh, great commentary you've given us, uh, sticking up for America and really giving it to those anti-American lefties and those black racists who uh, all have the same goal, and that is uh, troublemaking for America. And to follow up on uh, what you said in your opening remarks, I was glad that you uh, really picked up on the, li the constant barrage of lies that's being told about Jesse Helms and Newt Ingrich. Uh, now the latest insipid charge uh, that you mentioned before is that they're anti-Semitic. See, when all else fails, call someone a racist or an anti-Semite because that always works in America today. Uh, Jess, let's get something straight about Jesse Helms and Newt Ingrich. They are two of the strongest supporters of Israel and Jews in this country. In fact, Jesse Helms doesn't want Israel to sign a, a treaty with Syria because he doesn't trust Syria. That's and right. That's right. And what's amazing to me is that the, the individual who... Uh, 
who suddenly is finding, is uh, searching for anti-Semitism in Gingrich, has for so long been such a tremendous uh, fighter of anti-Semitism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get the point. The hypocrite. The, um, you know, and the so-called uh, children that are going to be grabbed out of the arms of poor people. What a lot. Now, children are not going to be taken away from their parents because they're, quote, poor. It's because their parents, if you can call them that, are irresponsible bums and drug addicts and alcoholics, and they're dangerous to the health of the children that liberals say they're concerned about. Jay, liberals are not concerned about anything. They will use children, even, even children if necessary, to further their left-wing agenda to make America look bad. And, and there's... Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say, there's no such thing as poor in America, except for maybe people in Appalachia who are white. To say that poor is defined by American liberals is ridiculous, because so-called poor people could actually be bringing any... In uh, anywhere from uh, twenty-eight to thirty-five thousand dollars a year, if everything they're getting from the government and the taxpayer is taken into account, and whenever the subject of orphans is being discussed that liberals disagree with because liberals don't want a society uh, to be improved, they thrive on anarchy and chaos. When a caller validates, a caller who's been in an orphanage calls and validates what Newt says about orphanages being much better for kids than uh, being with their crack mothers. The caller talks about his or hers personal experience, experiences. Liberals go nuts because it refutes their propaganda lies. And they start making fun of the caller and calling him names and just say, that, well, that's your ex experience. I didn't hear that. I was hiding in Denise's office, so I wouldn't have to. <laughs> that's my new technique when I come in. I, I don't blame you. I seclude myself. Uh, away from the world of radio in the immediate minutes before I go on the air myself. But, uh, but John, besides, I don't know what all this caterwauling is over the prospect of sending children to orphanages, largely uh, voluntarily. Besides, isn't it true? Where have I heard that it takes a village to raise a child? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Haven't I heard that? Yeah, I know what you're talking about, but... Uh... You know, it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can imagine that, that the, uh, uh, our, those so-called so children in the village, they, uh, they, they do nothing but come to uh, that village downtown and cause havoc. Some of those 25-year-old children should be put in orphanage, orphanages. We call them jail. Yeah, they're, they're hipsters. They're cool, though, you see. Uh, where, it's John, are, where Spike. John, are you getting branded? <laughs> <laughs> hey, what would you do to some guy who, who tries to brand you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd merge my fist with his 32 teeth. <laughs> These twins are waiting to meet his lips. <laughs> but you know, Jay, that Peter Noel that you had on last night. No, well, no. <laughs> I noticed that uh, he's got an accent. Uh, he's obviously from one of the uh, islands. You know, it's just as easy to leave this country as it is to get in. But I don't see him going anywhere. In typical black racist rhetoric, he talks about how bad America is, but he isn't about to leave, is he? Well, so that people don't misunderstand you. you don't, I'm certain you don't mean that all blacks are racist. What you mean is the, the black power militants. No. Of course, I, I, mean, well, I yeah. want to make that distinction because a lot of people right. may misunderstand you. Now, I just hate hypocrites, but he's a perfect example of many of the new type of immigrants that come to America, where they come here to get everything they can and cause trouble for the majority of the taxpayers who are white and see what they can get out of them. And when things don't go their way, they complain that the society is at fault. All right. Thank you, John, from Thank Staten you. Island. Many of those taxpayers are black, too, in all fairness to the listening audience. This is Jay Diamond. From Staten Island. Hello, John. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> uh, Jay, there's uh, three things I'd like to address. The first one is I also heard the continuing lies and distortions about uh, what the Republicans are up to. And uh, one of the distortions tonight I heard was that the money that's going to be taken away from these special interest groups like the Black Caucus and the Hispanic Caucus, those two racist uh, clown outfits, uh, it's, it, that money is not going to uh, the savings the Republicans are supposedly uh, 
going to uh, save money and uh, by taking the money away from these people. Yes, it will be savings, Jay, because even though it may go back into what's allocated for each senator's office as far as administration, that money will be available for more important things. Maybe that money can be used for computers, for schools, or for a liberal favorite, lunch programs. But at least it won't be going to fund organizations that hate America and most of the people in this country. It will go to better things. So as far as I'm concerned, and most decent Americans are concerned, that money will be saved for better purposes. And secondly, I heard that vicious, oily character, Marxist Mike from Long Island, I hear him all the time on uh, Curtis's or the Night Show, uh, saying that once again that uh, the, a the dropping of the A-bomb was a racist act. I might remind Marxist Mike, who has taken up uh, his uh, drumbeat over here on this station now, he switched from uh, the other station he used to attack every night with his anti-American rhetoric, Blonde-haired, blue-eyed Germany was our deadly enemy twice in this century, while Asians were our allies twice in this century, in South Korea and in Vietnam. Well, I go one step further. Uh, China was our ally in World War II. That's right. As a matter of fact... <laughs> the Japanese, they, 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 uh, they attacked China mercilessly. <laughs> right. Rapes, right? That's right, and Chiang Kai-shek was our ally. The Japanese, didn't they owe uh, some reparations to the Korean women they, they forced into prostitution? It was horrible. So, right? so th that's ridiculous what Marxist Mike said. Yeah, I mean, they were, what were they, what were they, racists when they, when they did that to other Asians? How stupid. And besides, we firebombed Germany at the end. Oh, they got it a lot worse Dresden, than Dresden, Cologne, Hamburg, come on. If the whole, the whole country was, uh, was ridiculous. ruined. Ridiculous, ridiculous. And a fellow, uh, a fellow Asian, Mao Zedong, said if he had a thousand atomic bombs, he would have used them on Japan for what the Japanese did to China. Well, let me tell you something. I, I only wish that I would have been in the Enola Gay to personally open the bomb hatch. Me too. I would have been your co-pilot. And uh, by the way, the bomb wasn't ready for Germany at the time Germany surrendered. And we didn't even know if it was going to be, if it was going to work when we dropped it on Japan. So Marxist Mike is all wet as usual. Yeah. And then Jay, yeah, Matt, uh, just let me go on. I want to hear what you say. But imagine that would have been good if you or I were in the, you and I in the Enola Gay. We were the crew. Okay, John, ready? <laughs> got, got it in your sights? <laughs> hey, this is from Pearl Harbor, Tojo. Bombs away, John. Uh, we bombed the Air Force on the ground. And, an, and there you are shaking your fist. And another thing, Tojo. Yeah. Take this for the Emperor. <laughs> this and is when, the, when the bomb bay door closed, what would you have said? Thank you. <laughs> All right, so go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't want to interrupt your, your presentation. Because you know that I value your presentation every evening. Thank you. You're welcome. So what, what was the next thing? Your, uh, your dissertation on the 1980s and the... Uh, capital gains tax was absolutely right. A firm uh, called Physical uh, uh, Associates conducted a study. In 1979, the maximum capital gains rate was 28%. Revenue generated by it was $10.6 billion. It stayed at 28% until 1981. In 1981, the capital gains was lowered to 23.7%. The amount of revenue generated increased from 10.6 in 1979 to 11.4 billion. In 1982, after the Reagan Tax Reform Act, the rate was lowered again to 20%, generating 11.8 billion dollars. In 1983, it generated 16.5 billion dollars. In 1984, 20.1 billion dollars. In 1985, it went up to 23.7 billion, and in 1986, the revenue generated by a lowering of the uh, capital gains tax was 46.7 billion, quadrupling the revenue from 10.6 to 46.7. And the, in 1986, when um, they, uh, it, when the uh, tax reform act was was passed, it was a mistake. They increased the capital gains back to 28 percent. In the first year, the revenue dropped from 46.7 billion to 27.7 billion. In 1988 and 1989, the revenue went back up to 31 uh, and 37 billion, 
But in 1990, it dropped to 29.3. In 1991, 26.5. And in 1992, 27.8. So there's no doubt that lowering the capital gains rate increases revenue. You are absolutely right. Well, I got news for you, John. If all these, uh, thank you for that backup. If all these left-wingers uh, love to use the coercive power of the government to raise taxes on behalf of social programs for ingrates, uh, then perhaps if there are so many liberals, so many left-wingers, maybe they should just organize a, instead of going through the government, maybe they should all get together in 50 states and form an organization and take charitable contributions from each other and raise the, the, the uh, same number of dollars that will be uh, lost in terms of tax cuts. And they can personally give th those, ta those dollars, those contributions, to all their uh, charges. Yeah. First, Jay, I'd like to see them start their own country. Because I don't, if they're going to do something like that, I don't even want to be in the same country as them because their, their policies and what they believe in inevitably turn out to be a disaster. You know, there's a lot of naive people out there, Jay. You hear them calling other shows. They actually believe this stuff. And they're really, well, I don't want to use the term that they use. They're, they're really uninformed. I, I don't want to sound arrogant. That's what liberals do to conservatives. They say, you're uninformed. No, you're, you're not arrogant. And I'm tired of people castigating you and saying that you're angry. You're not angry. You're indignant. And uh, your indignation is, is meritorious because your indignation is the frustration of a man who loves his country and loves the people in his country and is, is hurt deeply when he hears his country and its noble values be smirched by vermin. Thank you, right. John. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, uh, having said that... <laughs> You're a funny guy. Uh, <laughs> You're in the wrong business. Having said <laughs> all that. Uh, let me let me tell you about. Uh, you want to know about projects? I'll tell you about. You do it better than me. You want to do it just for? <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait. Did you hear this? What? Go ahead. Did you hear that Eli is going to get a shot on that sports station as a talk show host? Uh, why shouldn't he? <laughs> he's, he's better than anybody else in the business. You damn fool. <laughs> and you don't know who's going to be a screener yet, well, do you? A, I'm going to be a screener. Everybody knows that I'm fairly articulate. <laughs> 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 oh, why don't they give me a show? Well, he's going to be a screener <laughs> when you call up. Yeah, hello, I'd like to speak to Eli. No, no, I know, this will be Eli's first. Uh, hello, I I'd like to speak to Eli. Uh, what's your name, damn it? Uh, my name is Anthony from the Bronx. <laughs> oh, I know you, you damn fool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, birds of a feather. He should be screening on LIB. Is that true? Is Eli really going to be on the radio? Yep. Why am I the last to know? Why? Why don't I know these things? Why? Why does everybody know except me? Well, no, I mean it. I mean it. Why? That's because you don't know black people. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. That was John from Staten Island. Eli is really getting a rate temporary radio show? For how long? How, just, well, two hours is a long time. Wait, so, so, Birch, really? How did that... With me and John from Staten Island, you could imagine how the bombing would go with clockwork precision. We wouldn't hesitate for a moment. But let's say it was Woody Allen in there. You know, Woody Allen in the bomb bay. It was his mission to drop the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. <laughs> Private Allen, up front here. Get the bomb bay. Wait a minute. This is a big bomb. I've been working on it for months. I mean, do you think it's right? We're not here to decide whether it's right or wrong, son. Just open the damn bomb bay. Yeah, but wait a minute. A lot of people are going to be blown up. I mean, there's going to be a lot of smoke. How do you know? They've never dropped one of these things from a plane like this before. I mean, they tested it at, at Stag Field. They didn't even really blow it up. They went out to White Sands, and they had, like, a, a small version. How do we know we'll even fly away in time? What if it blows up before we get away? That's not our problem. We have to give our lives for our country. Yeah, but what if we're doing the wrong thing? Think of all those innocent Japanese soldiers down there. Think of all those factories that are working, employing people, making armaments to kill Americans. I don't think we're doing the right thing. Why don't we go home and think about it a little bit? Here, here's my Spinoza. Why don't you... Oh, okay, I'll open the box. See, it could have gone some way like that. Here at the synagogue, I, I hope Beth Galinsky's uh, protest didn't disturb you. Uh, by the way, uh, would you like me to send along your leftover schnapps and sponge cake? You do like me, don't you? You like me, Reverend. Does Reverend Jackson like... Yes, uh, thank you for liking me. It's 38 degrees. Single moment. Jay, um, I wanted to, I don't know where the heck to start tonight because there's so many things that I wanted to reply to, but 
Well, you can call back later if you leave anything out. <laughs> Nobody says you can't call back. I appreciate that. It's a long haul at night. I'm all alone here till 2 in the morning. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, you know, the hysteria of the, uh, the panicking liberals continues in the uh, aftermath of the great Republican elections. The, the histrionics about uh, how babies are going to be torn from the breasts of their uh, economically poor mothers. First of all, Jay, half of those mothers' breasts are filled with dope and other diseases, including the AIDS virus. And as far as the poor that's going to suffer as a result of Republicans taking away uh, welfare, which is a lie, by the way, uh, a mayor of uh, one town in Connecticut about two uh, months ago did a study and discovered that uh, around the first of every month, drug sales skyrocketed. And what did he, what did he, did he discover? Uh, the mayor discovered that welfare recipients were spending their monthly checks on drugs. I say start building those orphanages now. And Jay, I'll, I'll guarantee you that Tupac Secor would be uh, an altar boy today if Spencer Tracy could have gotten a hold of him and brought him up in Boys Town instead of being brainwashed by a mother that was a, a, a Black Panther. And Jay, conservatives and the so-called Christian right are always accused of demonizing people. In fact, yesterday, Bill Clinton suggested that Newt Ingridge's uh, a group start working with Democrats and stop demonizing. So today, the racist Jesse Jackson calls Christians Nazis, and the racist Black and Hispanic caucuses accuse the Republicans of ethnic cleansing for daring to cut off their unwarranted funding so they can hate America more. Who demonizes? You know, Jay, the great Frank of Queens made a great point today. He's not so he said, great. Excuse me? He's not so great. Ah, come on now. He's the greatest caller to talk radio. You know that. You're entitled to your opinion. But, <laughs> he said, uh, aren't these um, uh, fair-minded liberals who are blasting Newt Ingrich, the same hypocrites who said, let's give Bill Clinton a chance to do his job. <laughs> and, you know, they, even you agree. But, uh, you know, on the uh, show before yours, I heard the host criticizing the Republicans for using, uh, or supposedly Newt Ingridge and his uh, group of uh, victorious Republicans are using catchphrases and certain words to make Democrats look bad. You know, the, the, the mind game, she says, that they're, they're playing. Well, Jay, in the Washington Post a couple of months ago, Stanley Greenberg, the Clinton's official pollster, said in a memo to the Democratic congressional leadership dated October 12th, right before the election. The, the, uh, the memo says, uh, the message is much more powerful when it includes references to Reaganomics and Reagan's trickle-down policies, talking about how to attack the 1980s. And that's what, uh, that was the theme of Clinton's uh, uh, the election, uh, you know, go against the 1980s and Ronald Reagan. Well, Greenberg tested several phrases among voters. All right, it's getting, down. It's, getting, uh, it's getting tough to follow, Jay. Well, the fact is that uh, these, these phrases, Jay, the Democrats used them because they thought that they could get okay. at Reagan. All right. But that didn't work. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. On W. Funny. Well, <laughs> Jay, glad you uh, liked it, John. Yeah. <laughs> I like them all. They're funny. Um, that caller who called a little earlier the uh, typical counterculture type. If you'll notice, when he ran out of the argument, he did the usual counterculture liberal left-wing thing and just called you a name and hung up. But, uh, you know, these typical liberal hypocrites who keep bringing up Newt Ingridge's wife are the same phonies who said, Bill Clinton's personal life has nothing to do with his politics. And Bill Clinton, all of a sudden, Jay, just like when, during the campaign, he's starting to act like a conservative again. He wants $25 billion for the military in the next five years. Over the next five years, he wants a middle-class tax cut. Sounds like Ronald Reagan and the Republicans. He gets rid of Jocelyn Elders, something he knows uh, conservatives would have liked a long time ago. And Jay, to show you how despicable and hypocritical liberals are, Proposition 187 in California is being challenged, of course, as you know, isn't it the, the liberals who always talked about power to the people, the, the people should have the say, but yet when the people voted in the majority in a way that they didn't like, all of a sudden they're fighting the 
power to the people. And one liberal journalist in the New York Times yesterday said, uh, speaking of the Republican victories, quote, do we want to return to the dictatorship of the majority culture? See, when it didn't go their way, all of a sudden, they try and make majority sound like some kind of cult or culture because they don't like the results. Jay, isn't a dictatorship when the will of the majority is ignored by a dictator? Who are the little dictators in this country? You know, these are the same ones that said majority rule in South Africa. See, when supporting the majority benefits their uh, black racist anarchist allies in the United States and else, elsewhere, then the majority theory holds. And Jay, you hear a lot of blacks call this station asking, what have Republicans and conservatives ever done for blacks? Well, first of all, Jay, you, uh, you should be doing for yourself, and a party shouldn't exist to address the whims of one group anyway. I keep saying, take a look at how well majority, uh, minorities rather, did under Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. And last night on, um, on this station at 11 o'clock, I heard a report that uh, black women in America uh, increased the number of degrees they got in the fields of healthcare and engineering. It doubled in the 1980s. And what a racist country, Jay. Rashad Salam just won the Heisman Trophy. Hey, what do you think this is, a restaurant? Yeah, where, where, did, he, where did he get that name? What Cracker Jack box did he pull that name out of? <laughs> hey, hey, but you know something, John? I'll tell you, again, and you may say I'm a Pollyanna, but last week I, have, I had about 12 new callers call me, all of whom were black, many of whom called even before I had Mark Hardy on. These were conservative guys who, who felt about culture and politics the same way you do and I do. So when we speak of blacks, I think it's important and it's only fair to make a distinction between blacks who, who very often share my views and your views and militant black power radicals who are opposed to us. I think it's only, I don't want to insult people who are, who are good, fine people and who listen to me and feel the same about life and, and the world that I do by referring to them in the same bag as I might refer to somebody like uh, Al Sharpton. I think it's a disservice to those people. And I think you agree with me. Well, you know, look, I, I, when, when they become, let them start speaking up more and start fighting I think I just told you, I just told you. Didn't them. you hear the show last week? Yeah. But, uh, no, we still have a long way to go, Jay. I'm, I'm not criticizing those uh, those blacks. Look, you've heard me praise David of Irvington. No, I know, but, I mean, there were so many new people who called, and I think Mark Hardy is a very, very important Oh, he was person. great. He's going to come back here on the show, by the way. And, by the way, I want to thank Father Ernest, who I met at the uh, Amon Duran restaurant. He uh, called Bob this afternoon and said a few kind words about me. I hope he's listening. Tonight. I know, Ernie. I know, Ernie. I heard that. Yeah, he was a... Uh, He's a great guy. Yeah, wasn't he? All right. Thank you, John. Thank you. On W... That is uh, so vastly inferior to the high-class mail-order houses like L.L. Bean. Uh, I made the mistake of buying something at Daymark, and I needed it to give to somebody else as a present who was leaving town this week. And so I said, listen, I'll send this, send this to me, FedEx. I'll pay $20 extra on this $49.99 item. So she says... Uh, no, I... Well, I can't do that, y'all. I can't do that. You have to... I'm Debbie, and I can't do that. Best we have is Express. I said, really? How much more for the six ninety five? I said, all right, do it. When when will that... Well, that's two-day air. Oh, great. So I'll have it the day after tomorrow. No, you have it in five days. I thought you said it's two-day air. Well, our two-day air gets there in five days. So why don't you call it five-day air? I don't know. You have to talk to my supervisor about that. I said, all right, all right. I knew I was getting it over my head. But I, uh... I tried it anyway. Anyway, so I say, send me this $49.99 item, and I'll pay the extra $6.95. Makes it $56.94. We go over the whole thing. I'm supposed to have it in five days, four days from that day. There was some, and I went over this five or six times with this, this lunkhead, Debbie, and uh, she said, okay, fine, we do it. I called up today to see whether it had been shipped because I knew something would go wrong because she was lame. And she made a mistake. Turns out she did not send it express after all. She, so I'm going to get it in 12 days, which is no good because the person I was going to give it to is leaving the country and I the traveling and I, it was for that person to travel with. You see what I'm saying? So it was frustrating. Do you know I spent two hours on the phone today with that lame company, with that uncaring, incompetent, cheap 
company, Daymark, trying to ascertain why this woman bollocked up the simplest thing that after all wasn't brain surgery, all anybody would tell me after hanging up on me, putting me on hold for countless periods of 20 minutes or more, all they would tell me was finally, well, she made a mistake. Everybody makes mistakes, Mr. Diamond. Everybody makes mistakes. All right, you got me there. They sure do. And in the Daymark company, they make them all the time. What's more, they don't care that they make them. So they continue to make them. And that's why planes crash, because people don't take the trouble to do it right. On WABC, this is Jay Diamond. He was in awe. Uh, what makes you think Bob didn't know? Oh, he, he looked like he was... He was in on it, pal. He, he was, was in on it. Was he? Yes. Oh, he was genuinely surprised. He was in on it. Was he? Yes. Oh, darn it. Well, you'll have to... The world will never know whether uh, he knew about it or whether he was in shock. <laughs> I'm not saying... Right here on WABC Radio, 994 A.D. And so, for the first time in 1,000 years, the Mighty Diamond art players in a multicultural Christmas carol. Dead. There was no doubt about it. Uh, that's uh, why they uh, buried him, you know. They had to. He was starting to go bad. <laughs> now you uh, now you know why your mother always warned you to keep a uh, fresh pair of underwear, because, uh, because uh, I'll uh, tell you, there's nothing worse than a uh, good man gone bad. <laughs> joke. It's a joke. Well, we've exhausted that topic. Now, where was I? Oh, yes. Okay. Marley was dead and screwed. Uh, Ebenezer screwed. He'd been Marley's business partner for, I don't know, uh, how many years. He was a uh, horrible man, horrible and arrogant, greedy, and uh, egotistical man. And I've said the same thing about Mayor Kahana and David Duke. So, uh, cold, so cold-hearted was Ebenezer Scrooge, the street beggars wisely withdrew their outstretched palms when he came their way, lest they draw back nubs. And uh, the homeless and drunken hipsters also recognized the, the prudence of relieving themselves in the shrubbery of others. For to raise the ire of Marley's partner, Ebenezer, was to find true meaning in the phrase, <laughs> getting screwed. <laughs> and he was as horrible a person, the, a human being that he was, for 11 months a year, no season caused him more distemper. Uh, uh, than uh, and that of the uh, of uh, the the uh, Christmas uh, holiday. He hated Christmas. I beg your pardon, sir. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Marley of the firm of Marley and Scrooge? I am Scrooge, sir. Aha, Mr. Scrooge. As you know, the holidays are once again upon us, and each season we take a collection from amongst the community to help the disenfranchised and those of an entitlement background. How much may I put you down for, sir? How much? Yes, sir. Tell you what. Close your eyes. That's it. Real tight. Good. Now tell me what you see. I see nothing, sir. Good. You're very perceptive. Now hit the road. Leave me alone. But, Mr. Scrooge, we can't turn our backs on those less fortunate... Oh, no? Watch me. Let me ask you something. Are there no food stamps? Why, yes, of course there are. Are there no programs, huh? Are there no single occupancy in Section 8 housing projects for them to go to? Yes, yes, I'm sad to say, but, but most would rather find honest work than to avail themselves of the state. <laughs> Bull bullshit! Next thing you know, you'll be telling me Abraham Lincoln was an African-American. Ha! Listen, if the riffraff are gonna all of a sudden get so high and mighty, then let them move to Jersey and decrease the suppressed population. Now, get out of my face. Now, look it. With perfect strangers, he uh, was bad enough. But, but when dealing with those in his employ, he was a real SOB. Uh, believe me, I know one when I see one. Ebenezer Scrooge treated the help uh, like a baby uh, treats diapers. <laughs> Cratchit! Cratchit! Get over here! Bob Cratchit! Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yes, Mr. Scrooge, sir? I suppose you'll want the whole day off tomorrow, as usual. Well, look, Mr. Scrooge, I... I mean, if it's not too much trouble, pal, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna... 
Well, it is too much trouble. Imagine the nerve of you people. Next thing you know, you'll be wanting a 40-hour work week. I suspect you'd feel yourself ill-used if I deducted your salary half a farthing for my inconvenience, you ingrate. You know, I really got to laugh at you measly underclass drones. You think you got it so bad. What do you people got to get upset about anyway? Every night, you waddle off to your little hovels like you're having a care in the world. So a little plague now and then, so what? It's nothing that a good flash fire won't cure, and I understand you have them all the time. No, Cratchit, having lots of money, that's the real curse. But don't you worry, Cratchit. You just stick with me, and I promise you'll never need worry about an overabundance of money. In fact, just to show what a wonderful boss I am, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Starting next week, you take home salary, it'll be cut in half. This way, you'll be spared all the headaches of having too much. But Mr. Scrooge, I... Not now, not now. There's no need to thank me. Just get out of here and I'll... Oh, by the way, Cratchit, uh, that daughter of yours, she's what, uh, 18, 19 years of age about now, isn't she? She just turned 19 last weekend, Mr. Scrooge, and she's the apple of my eye. Well, send her around to my place tonight. I have a few uh, chores need doing around the house. Wow, do you have a position in mind for her, sir? I have several positions in mind for her, Cratchit. Now, get lost. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Good night, sir, and uh, a Merry Christmas. Christmas. Ha! <laughs> Bullshale. So, as uh, Bob Cratchit slowly trod uh, quietly uh, into uh, the night, Scrooge put out the office light and headed to his favorite bodega, where every evening at precisely uh, quarter past six, there would be found uh, Ebenezer dining alone on his, uh, <laughs> on his usual fare. <laughs> hey! One <laughs> cheese and catsup sandwich. <laughs> Juan, damn it! Come over here and stop playing behind the counter. Stop cringing under the counter just because people walk in the store. Cheese and catsup sandwich on an onion roll, the usual, and an order of <laughs> an order of prune juice in a dirty glass. Steve, Senior Scrooge. Yeah, and be quick about it too. As was his routine, every night after dinner, uh, Scrooge would walk off his uh, sumptuous meal with a uh, jaunty walk home to a certain place where he lived in a fabulously bejeweled residence with 24 karat, solid 24 karat gold, uh, bathroom ornaments and fixtures and uh, a uh, retinue of retainers. I mean, he, he, he practically emptied the employment agencies just for the uh, staffing of the house. He must have had servants, hundreds, 200 servants, uh, beautiful potted palms. He had, uh, he had like a menagerie there, uh, better than Michael Jackson. He had the garage full of cars, rented the whole building next door and gutted it just to make a garage out of it on Sutton Place, his collection of cars, also all the solid gold. <laughs> Anyway, stopping occasionally to spit on homeless people, the only pastime for which he ever found uh, any, uh, any pleasure. Oh, you want some loose change? Well, here. It's all I could spare. <laughs> well, what did you expect? Huh? <laughs> oh, life is good. I'm having fun. <laughs> you expect it, and I expect the rated. <laughs> But the screwed near his home, an eerie feeling overtook him, uh, sending a, a shiver down his spine. At first, he, he thought it was the uh, catsup sandwich and that Juan had failed to wash his hands after coming out of the uh, men's room because he uh, couldn't read English. Screwed! <laughs> huh? Huh? What? Oh, hey! Jeez! Got a grip, Ebenezer. Probably one of those those bums back there asking for food. Arriving at his front door, Scrooge reached out his hand to open its oversized solid gold lock. But what met his astonished face was a vision. The vision of a familiar face. Molly! It's you, Molly! <laughs> all right, all right, Ebenezer. Get hold of yourself. Now, just calm down. There's a, there's a logical explanation for all this. Probably just, just a little dehydration. Yeah, that's it. Spitting on all those indigents must have dried me up. That's right. I have to take some lozenges when I get in. That guy in the wheelchair just wore me out. I got to learn to take it a little easier. That's all. Uh, once uh, inside, once in the house, Ebenezer managed to calm himself down, and uh, he made himself a, a nice uh, bed lunch and was just about to retire for the evening. 
<laughs> I guess I'll have to brown bag it tomorrow. Those little midgets at the bodega are taking the whole day off. Damn foreigners. Screwed! Screwed! Hey, hey, who's there? Who's there, I say? Screwed! Ebenezer Screwed! Where are you? Show yourself, man. Over here, man! Ah, the ganja, man! Oh, that's good stuff, man. I hate Jed Diamond, but I love Lynn Samuel. Oh, Marley, it's you. But, but it, it can't be you. You are you. You're, you're dead. Is that the word you've been looking for, man? Well, that I am. Me body finishing around no more. Me motor cold. Got up in smoke. <laughs> and they come to warn you, man. Warn me? Isn't that what smoke detectors are for? <laughs> It, it reeks in here. What's that thing you're puffing on, a baseball bat? <laughs> I smoke the fliv that I roll in me life, man. Oh, I miss me fliv. I miss me ganja, man. Oh, very bad, very bad. Well, look, Marley, or whatever your name is, I ain't buying into this Casper the Friendly ghost routine. I don't believe in ghosts, and I don't believe in spooks. So, uh, nice try. Now, why don't you just blow out, blow out of here with the rest of the west wind? Oh! <laughs> you one more. I do believe in you. I do believe in you. I do, I do, I do, I do, I do believe in you. I do, I do, I do. Well then, man, you best be prepared to change you nasty, nasty ways, man. You stand a lot like Jed Diamond, man. And he evil, man. Jed Diamond evil. You're going to be just like him, for if you don't, and keep the path you're going. The hell is all for your soul, man. It's hotter than any known. Well, well, gee, Molly, I'll, I'll do whatever you say, really. You know, I don't know how to thank you for helping me out like this. You're making me feel kind of sorry I sold your ashes to the etch sketch people. But, but you just tell me what I gotta, what, what I gotta do. At the stroke of midnight, man, you'll be visited by the likes of three spirits, man, three ghost spirits, man. Just bear it, man, or you end up like Jed Diamond, man. You learn your lesson. And, uh... Really, just like your Marley promised at the final stroke of 12, the first of three visits began. Three. This is what happened. Boom! 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 Oh, oh, oh. oh. <coughs> honey, honey, the faucet's leaking in the... Should I call the plumber or Tiffany's? What, what, who, what, who are you? I'm, a, I'm the ghost of Christmas past. <laughs> and you, you must be screwed. <laughs> yes, yes, I am screwed. Are you here to show me things? I'm here to show you the past. Really? No brag, just back. <laughs> just touch my robe. Oh, hey, Mr. Ghost, where are you taking me? Isn't this the state prison? Yes, sir, yes, sir, it sure is. You're a very popular man in these here parts. <laughs> I'd say you're more popular than anybody else. You see that man over there? You recognize him, don't you? Why, that there's Mr. Thomas Grasso. You saved him from the Oklahoma death penalty. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Earned you quite a rep <laughs> reputation. <laughs> That's Grasso, all right. I, I don't like to brag, but they, they called me a shining example of merciful civility and a, and a great humanitarian. The way I heard it, on 77, they called you a big spot team and a two big cock of soap. <laughs> well, well, yeah, that too, but they meant it in a nice way. You know something, Pilgrim? I ain't been around you five minutes, and I already wish I was dead again. <laughs> Where are we going next, Mr. Ghost? We ain't going no place. You're going back to bed, and, and I got to take Geraldo Rivera back to Al Capone's board. Good luck, spot team. <laughs> Oh, this is getting scary, I'm afraid. So anyway, at uh, Ebenezer, uh, he found himself uh, right back where he started from, in his own bed, and uh, just in time, too, because the clock was just striking midnight again. Look, I didn't write this stuff. I, I just read it. Okay. Uh, Excuse me, I'm looking for Ebenezer screwed. I am screwed. You're telling me? Look, the regular guy called in six, so I'm filling in. I ain't got all night, okay? All right? I'm the ghost of Christmas present, etc., etc., etc. Come on, let's go. I got a neat slot make later for dinner. 
Show us the ghost. Where are we going? Uh, don't this place look familiar? It's the home of Bob Cratchit, your oldest employee. You know, the one you treat like crack. Oh, that Bob Cratchit. Yeah, that Bob Cratchit. Look, here he comes now. Alice! Alice, honey, I'm home, honey. Alice, where'd everybody go? Ah, uh, Tim. My tiny Tim. Hobble on over here and give your father a proper welcome, kid. Welcome home, father. I happen to see you in the house tonight on Christmas Eve. So, son, tell me, where's your mother? She'll be right back, father. She had to go next door to borrow a cup of a cup of gruel. Boy, oh boy, gruel. Looks like we eat tonight. So tell me, how was school today, son? Wonderful, father. Guess what? I'm going to be in the Mechanics High School Christmas pageant. No, don't tell me. Uh-huh. Mr. Johnson said I couldn't be in the chorus line, you know, because my legs is all crooked, but he said if I painted my crutches silver, I could play I could play the part of the metal detector. Boy, that's swell. Father? Yes, my son? How come my legs don't work like the other kids? Well, you see, son, it happened a long time ago. You were just a baby, and times were hard then. You know how it is. And, well, your mother and I rented you out to a bunch of Mexicans for the Christmas party they were throwing. I don't know, I thought they were going to use you in a manger scene or something like that. You know, I didn't think it was anything of it. So we dropped you off, got the money, and didn't think anything of it. It wasn't until later that night that I found out what a pinata was. But, but by then it was already too late. I didn't mean to do it. I didn't... I didn't know. I never realized. Maybe somebody ought to do something for that poor boy. What, are you nuts? Listen, that kid's going to go up to be more trouble than he's worth. Do yourself a favor and forget about it. Well, if you say so, maybe I'll just have him put over for a lunch sometime. You know, I'll bring him over and lay out a nice spread for him. Schmuck! You don't listen very well, do you? Take your own advice. Remember, if it's going to be such trouble, let him move to Jersey and decrease the soup breast population. Got it? I guess you're right. Oh, my God, look at the time. I got to go. Good luck to you. But, but, but what about me? Hey, hey, wait a minute. You're supposed to take me home so I can meet the third ghost. Don't worry, he'll find you. Just stay put. I'd take you back, but it's getting late, and Slotnik, Slotnik don't like to be kept waiting. Well, fell the reason. Terrific. He runs off the feet of space at the Friars Club and leaves me here in the middle of Loserville. I'll probably get head lice. Excuse me. What is it, old-timer? I'm looking for a man. You want Christopher Street. Three blocks that way, make a left. No, no, I'm looking for a guy named Scrooge. Are you Scrooge? Yes, I am Scrooge. Pleased to meet you, Scrooge. Glad to know you. I'm the ghost of Christmas yet to come, and together, you and I, and we the people can make a difference, and boldly go where no man has gone before, Scrooge. All right, all right, let's get this thing over with. Okay, then, just grab hold of my magic pointer. <sighs> Say, Mr. Ghost, who's that old man hanging around the playground? That's Frank Rottenberg. He's scouting for a new wife. Mr. Ghost, where are we now, and who's that man sitting behind the microphone? He, he looks familiar. Just shush a minute and listen. Hello, you're on the air. Baba Booey, Baba Booey, Baba Booey, Bob. Hello, you're on the air. Yeah, I'm on the air, damn it. I just want to say that I heard what you told that caller before, and I just wanted to say that you don't have your facts straight, you damn fool. Mr. Ghost, you gotta tell me, is that me sitting there? Is, is this my fate, talking to stupid people on the, on the radio? And uh, the, uh, the spirit then led him to uh, the corner where stood a newspaper vending machine, uh, and in total silence, he uh, raised his arm and pointed a stubby little finger at uh, Ebenezer, then pointed towards the uh, headlines. Mr. Ghost, the headlines you're pointing out, do they foretell my destiny? Does this typeface prophesy that what will happen or only what might be in store for my future? Come on, Mr. Ghost, I got a lot of lot writing on this. But uh, the spirit remains silent still, uh, uh, pointing at the, the future uh, headline as uh, Ebenezer approached. All right, Mr. Ghost, you win. You win. I'll, I'll, I'll... Oh, 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 oh no, look what it says. Pataki elected governor. Oh, promises to restore death penalty. No, no. Swears pledge to, to cut taxes. Yeah! Spirit, spirit, please, please, I'll be good, really. Just give me another chance, please. I'll do anything, anything you say, only please. I'll get Nambla to drop out of the gay pride parade. I'll, I'll, I'll talk nice about Newt Gingrich, but I beg you, not, not Pataki. No, no, I can't, not him. Oh, no, no, please. Uh, uh, what, what, what's that? I'm in, I'm in my own bed. How, how did it get so wet? 
kind of warm, too, but... But, hey, I'm, I'm alive. I'm still here. I pulled it off. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Where do I... Where do I start? What do I do first? The prison. The prison. <laughs> I'll call the prison. Hello, Warden. Let me talk to Thomas Grasso. Hello, Thomas. I've got some good news for you. <laughs> Pack your bags. <laughs> That's right. You're going home, son. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> oh, I feel so giddy. Cratchit. Yeah, I've got to call Cratchit. He's next. Hello. May I speak with Bob Cratchit, please? Hello, Bob. Bob Cratchit. Merry Christmas, Bob. Who? What do you mean, who? It's me, my dear Cratchit. Ebenezer Scrooge. Yes, yes, it's me, I swear to you. I know it doesn't sound like me, but it really is me. It's the new me, the real me. I'm screwed. But, but I just called to ask about that family of yours, Cratchit. I understand your, your son Tim isn't doing too well. <laughs> yes, yes, I know, but, but don't worry, Bob. I'm going to take care of everything. Here's all I want you to do. Just bring him here and drop him off with me this weekend. I'm going to take him hunting with me. And it didn't stop there. Scrooge went on to become a real man of his uh, word. Uh, uh, most of the time, anyway. Yeah, he still had the little uh, regressions, but uh, he didn't the best of them do. Me, too. I'm included. I'm not special. And from that day forward, uh, except uh, for that uh, very unfortunate hunting accident, Scrooge made every effort to gain the love and the respect of his fellow man. Uh, of course, uh, Pataki still won the election. And for the rest of his days, uh, Scrooge not only celebrated the Christmas holidays, but he kept alive the spirit of Christmas all year long, inspired by the memory of his dear late uh, friend, uh, Tiny, uh, uh, Tiny Tim, whose words still survive to this day. No justice, no peace? No, that's so stupid. Do it right. Okay, uh, God bless us, everyone. That didn't hurt, did it? I guess not. Merry Christmas, everyone. And uh, Merry Christmas to you on WABC. Yeah, you were asking opinions on whether uh, uh, people should uh, take a look at their own personal relationships. Jay, I happen to think that they're uh, interrelated. The way we feel about politics in our country and how we deal with people. Uh, I don't think that it was just an accident that uh, when Ronald Reagan and the Republicans made us feel the way we sh uh, should feel about America, that there was more given to charities in that decade than any other decade. Charities are down in the 1990s. People don't feel as good about their country. I think they are interrelated. And it makes me, when I can zap liberals and Democrats 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I never get tired of it. It's almost a cat and mouse game because they're no, uh, they're no challenge. It's so easy to destroy them. I get a kick out of it. Maybe I'm just, uh, maybe I'm vicious in that way, but I think when it comes to enemies of America, we have to be vicious because we're dealing with the vicious. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank, you, thank you, John. I'm a little at sea. Here, I won't. All right. John Podhoritz, I'm, not, I'm just going to quote a little bit. Connie Chung's latest sickening stunt. I'm glad you called about this, Sam. It's been on my mind. If you remember, I was on the air Tuesday night. Yeah. And the AP wire was thrust in my hand by Chris Brandemarty, who had been working in the newsroom that night. So I got that story on the air as soon as we found out about it. And I was stunned by it. What a... What a sneak. What an insidious thing to do. But listen to this. Okay. Connie Chung's latest sickening stunt, seducing Newt Gingrich's mother into saying the new House Speaker thinks Hillary Rodham Clinton is a bitch, means it's time to take the gloves off with her. You'd have thought Chung would have learned to stop embarrassing herself after her ludicrous journalistic aggressiveness in pursuit of ice skater Tanya Harding, who, as Dave Barry put it, became such a huge international celebrity that she couldn't floss her teeth without elbowing Connie Chung in the head. Well, I wish she would have not been sent to her when she elbowed her. Wait, there's more. All right. But then some people just never learn. There's no other way to put this and get it right. Connie Chung is cheesy. All her affectations, the eye batting, the cutesy grinning, the overdone solemnity, the speak a person long on ambition and short on taste. She was a cheesy reporter. She's a cheesy anchorwoman. And her work on eye to eye with Connie Chung is so appalling, it doesn't even deserve... Let me go to the other page here. Okay. So appalling, it doesn't even deserve the word cheesy. Processed cheese food would be closer to the truth. Well, I think it would more resemble a turd to tell you the truth. It Pardon? disgusts me. What is that? It more resembles a turd. That's the way you speak on the radio? Yeah. Sorry about that. Or you're a high-class guy. <laughs> you're, well, you're, are you a Harvard man, Sam? Um, actually, I go to the CW Post College. You're not, you're not embarrassed to diminish yourself I, and lower yourself I, and, look, and try to stop. take me with. That's the way you speak. That's um, the way your parents taught you to speak. It's just that 
You know that my mother, my mother didn't speak, teach me to speak the way your mother taught you to speak. That's the difference between my mother and your mother. On WABC, this is Jay Diamond. Up. Uh, <laughs> where was Curtis when that bomb went off in the subway a couple of weeks ago? Down stuck in concrete and down in the slime and grime in the dirty grid. Where was he? <laughs> could take place with the guardian angels all over the I'm place. Gonna make, anyway, I'm going to make peace between you and Curtis. Fuck, you'll never become a full-fledged member of the guardian angels because you're not a pathological liar. You don't file false police reports, and you don't fake your own kidnapping. Now, let me get to Bill Clinton. You know, uh... You are talking about my brother. Yeah, yeah, the, your brother that replaced you on the... <laughs> years ago and didn't buy, mind it very much. You know, him and that uh, talk about, you know, I think... Leave him alone, I come on. Ingridge's mother was talking about... Uh, oh, Lisa. please. Uh, you know, Bill Clinton's birthday, <laughs> I welcome... You are full of hate. You're full of hate, man. <laughs> full of truth. You know, I had a laugh at Bill Clinton the other day, John. Yeah, but you'll, you'll like Curtis when, when he is going to Kane College and, and uh, verbally thrashing the activists. I'll bring him a gift, a bar of soap and a, a shaving. All right, all right, all right. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I, um, Bill Clinton said, I welcome the new Congress. Yeah, he welcomes the new Congress like a Jew would uh, welcome Yasser Arafat to a gefilte fish dinner. You know, Jay, the liberal pundits have been saying continuously, to get elected is one thing. Now the ball is in the Republicans' court, and they have to perform. Now they want miracles, Jay, after they almost destroyed this society, and the Republicans have already performed. Despite all the lies, if you take a look at the 1980s, everyone did better. Most people did better, especially minorities, and I'm going to continue pounding away at that. Can you imagine if Ronald Reagan and George Bush didn't come in between Jimmy Carter? You know. Jay, if the Democrats are so much better for the, quote, poor, then how come uh, the economic years of the late 1970s and mid-70s when the number one humanitarian liberal, Jimmy Carter, was in office, they were the worst economic years in 50 years. Does that sound familiar? And for those who would say that it was because of the oil embargo, it doesn't wash because there was a worse oil embargo in 1973 and 74, and our economy was pretty good. Bill Clinton also said, I think people are sick, literally sick, of the political infighting and bickering. And he, uh, so then he goes on to say, oh, by the way, now we're supposed to cooperate, see, so he and his Democrats can look better in a couple of years and get reelected. Then he went on to say, my job is not to do what they did, be an obstructionist. Well, besides that being a lie, that's a great way to start a new spirit of cooperation, eh, Jay? And uh, I heard a few liberals say, uh, Howard Stern at George Pataki's inaugural speech? Now you know the type of people we're going to be dealing with. Oh, but it was all right to invite Los Angeles gang members hey, to the inaugural hey, ball. Hey, hey, John, John, why are you so angry? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I think I'll get myself banned, but I won't get a, uh, an ulcer. Nah, you'll never be banned. Yeah. No, never. As long as I'm here, you won't be banned on my show. Ever. No, not your show. What? Uh, I'll get into that with another time. Oh, with you. all right. But uh, one more thing. What? All of this talk of all the bad things that are going to happen with this new Republican leadership, well, that's more fright tactics of the Democrats and the liberals. That's what they've resorted to. You know, Jay, the... Uh, the liberals have been saying that tax cuts in the 1980s were the reason for deficits going up. No, it wasn't the tax cuts. When the capital gains was lowered from 28% to 20% in the 1980s, the intake to the Treasury quadrupled. So what was the story? Why, why did the deficits go up? Because of Democratic spending. And how can Ronald Reagan be blamed for all the cutbacks that hurt so many people? They want to blame him for all the cutbacks and yet for the deficit at the same time. Well, hey, John, but, w w you know, you talk about liberals. I was reading Newt Gingrich's speech uh, as he opened the House of Representatives session yesterday. He sounded like a liberal. Did you no, hear the things he said? Yeah, he said that uh, FDR was the yeah. greatest president. But you see, Jay, there's a difference. FDR was in a different time when most Americans were still patriotic. 
That's you didn't have the freaks that are out of the woodwork now. A quarter of the American people are a bunch of left-wing communists. You didn't have that many back then. Back then, if you were a liberal, you were a true but liberal he, in the tradition of uh, Hubert Humphrey. He praises the Democratic Party for, uh, for an integrated fighting for an integrated America. Uh, the fact is it was the liberal wing of the Democratic Party that ended segregation. He goes on to say that, um, that uh, I think of my nephew, I don't believe there is a single American who can see a news report of a four-year-old thrown off of a public housing project in Chicago by other children and killed and not feel that a part of your heart went. Well, you know what? All of those, uh, all of those blacks that went along with the Democrats who fought for integration, I guess they can start hating the Democrats now because obviously they don't believe in what they it, tried. It sounds to me, John, that Newt Gingrich is expressing compassion <laughs> right we have more compassion than anyone in, and they know it jay it's the truth the compassion is measured by how many people don't need public assistance well, remember john hold on i'm not tired yet <laughs> jay <laughs> mike thompson whenever she speaks in public belies the new softer cookie baking Hillary image. Oh, did I say new softer cookie baking image? Wasn't it two years ago that she tried to soften her image by talking about baking cookies? No, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is the fate of Hillary Clinton to be perceived for exactly that which she is, a self-important, self-aggrandizing, uh, well, the best description, I guess, is the description that the Speaker of the House of Representatives confided to his mother, who in turn confided it to Connie Chunk. Uh, uh, remember this about Hillary Clinton and her husband, and this is all you really have to know when sizing up whom to vote for in 1996, if it comes to that. These two steadfastly, with resolution, refused to disclose their income tax returns for the time they were they were in office together as governor and uh, first governor of Arkansas, if you remember, they were they were up against it for the entire campaign, and then well into this administration, if you can call it an administration, it is really a confusion of an administration, a mess from January 20th, 1993 till today, till January 20th, 1997. This has been continues to be, and always will be, a mess. This is the same, This a metaphor for this administration, ladies and gentlemen, is what's on the floor of a frat house on initiation night. That's what the Clinton administration is. Uh, remember, they were, they did not want to reveal those tax forms. They were very firm in refusing to reveal those tax forms. It was only a day after that famous press conference I think. No, no, it was before the press conference in the pink suit, but it was when Whitewater was beginning to really emerge as a headache for these people that they were forced into disclosing their tax forms. And once they did, it became immediately apparent why the determination to not disclose those tax returns. And I'll remind you, in case you forgot, the reason Hillary and her husband were diffident about revealing their tax returns, ladies and gentlemen, is because those tax forms proved that she had invest, uh, pardon me, she had uh, <laughs> pretended to invest $1,000 and 11 months later come away with over $101,000. They did not want you to know that she made $100,000 in something like nine months because they knew that people would be onto them. They knew that once people saw as was revealed on those tax forms, that she had purportedly invested $1,000 only to have walked away with $101,000 a mere nine months later. They knew that you would know that they were probably hiding something else, i.e. a scheme to enrich themselves at the expense of a fair and open commodities market. And then, of course, it was revealed that, that she had help from James Blair. But, of course, it didn't have anything to do with anything. Well, what's wrong if she got some, uh, uh, in, quote, investment advice from James Blair? Oh, only that James Blair was the in-house counsel for Tyson Foods, 
which was the biggest supporter as well of Clinton for governor, as well as being the largest employer in the state of Arkansas. And this is the man giving, quote, investment advice to the wife of the then governor who stands to make important decisions with respect to the future of Tyson Foods. And there's no conflict in that. Huh? No, that's the reason she can never soften her image, because once those tax returns were disclosed, ladies and gentlemen, despite their best efforts to confuse the situation, to obfuscate the true facts, the American people knew these people to be nothing but two self-important, self-aggrandizing, smarmy hypocrites who decried a so-called decade of greed while they were lining their own pockets without any chance. And uh, back to Jimmy right now from Brooklyn. I can't take a subway. Heavens forbid. Heaven forfend. I would never do that. Such loathsome creatures down there. <laughs> but <laughs> even though I am a man of the people, I prefer to view them from a safe distance. Let's see, I can't take the subway. Won't take a bus. Roaches on those buses anyway. Besides, I can't take a shower if I have to at a moment's notice on a bus. Oh, you don't like it because I'm clean and well-dressed. You'd rather see me in chains, I suppose. You see, I could walk. Oh, heck no, I, I can't walk. Maybe I should go around in a wheelchair like Guy Caballero on SCTV. Get a lot of respect that way, anyway. Let me see. Now, good job, John. <laughs> I, I can't take a train, I can't take a bus, and I can't walk. Hmm. That just leaves a taxi cab. Dirty little things. Well, I have to, and such horrible drivers, barely speaking English, which I speak so perfectly, even though I prefer to be speaking African. <laughs> when I do speak African, no one understands me. <laughs> Let's see, I just summoned, oh, taxi. I said taxi, you damn it. There goes another one. All right, let me try it again. Let me try it again. I said taxi. Taxi! Take off this white scarf. Maybe if I wave it around. Taxi! Hey! I said, hey, come back here, you... I don't know. Maybe I better try a limo service. Uh, here's how it would sound. Is Cuomo really going to do things like... And, and that's why it's a very dangerous idea to have a balanced budget. We have to be careful about getting ourselves locked into anything in granite that we can't get out of once it's a constitutional amendment. Thank you, Tim. You know, folks, my friends Jay and Mark at the Bloomfield Steak and Seafood House are offering an incredible New Year's special throughout the month of January. Would you believe a 24-ounce, yes, 24-ounce grilled Delmonico steak for $11.95? Now, if you've heard me talk about the Bloomfield Steak and Seafood House, you know that these guys would never sacrifice quality for quantity. So be assured that what you are getting is the bargain of a lifetime. Call the Bloomfield Steak and Seafood House at 1-800-70-STEAK for reservations. That's 1-800-70-STEAK. This offer is valid for lunch and dinner, and not valid on Saturdays. And don't forget to try their other fine restaurant, the Meadowlands Steak and Seafood House, just two miles from Giant Stadium, Bloomfield Steak and Seafood, and Meadowlands Steak and Seafood, two of the finest restaurants in the metropolitan area. And now, back to the phones on WABC. Vila Shabazz, they showed two cuts of Louis Farrakhan on TV today. They showed the first cut they showed was with Barbara Walters, from this past summer when she interviewed him as he was wearing his characteristic, his singular orange suit. I like that orange worsted that he has. If only he had some polka dots or crescents or something in there. Anyway, he's sitting there in his orange suit and she asks him, did you have anything to do with the assassination of Malcolm X? And he says, no, Barbara, I had nothing to do with the assassination of brother Malcolm. Nobody could say that there was no dispute. Nobody could say there was an absence of disagreements between my brother Malcolm and myself. But I had nothing to do in that soft, affected, phony voice that he makes. And then they showed from a few years ago a, a Farrakhan addressing his throng. And instead of sounding like this, it was the same physical man, but contrary to this tone of voice, he said, Eldiff! 
Malcolm was a traitor, and we dealt with him as any nation deals with a traitor. Whose business is that? It's the same man. On WABC. Started again with his attempts in trying to fool us. Trying Look, to out of the us. people, out of the people that call me, you're talking to, you're talking about Hilly. If you've listened to some of the, the real lowlifes that have called me, some of the real demons that come out of the telephone, I'm going to tell you something. He is not the worst of them. Oh, he's a demon. No, this, right. this guy that just called, for example, or the other guy who made up a lie about my Christmas skit, these people are irritating, but but I, I have to say that in with respect to all the people that call me, particularly tonight, he is not that irritating. Well, he's a, he's a, a quiet... Uh, you cross him and see what happens, you know? He said... Um, no, but why don't you concern yourself with uh, with the guy who just calls up and calls Reagan the doorstop and you're a racist, or the other guy who says who makes up that I said spook in my uh, Christmas play when I never said that? Well, that doesn't bother you. These these terrible injustices that are that are hurled at me. I didn't even know what the heck he was talking. Well, all right, now you know. But uh, look, I we expect our friends to defend us. Anyone who hates Ronald Reagan, America, or. Uh is a black racist, I'm going to battle. If I know what the heck they're talking about... You mean you about, wouldn't battle a white racist? Uh, a, a white racist? Yeah. Like who? You said you'll battle a black racist. You yeah. make a distinction between... between. I mean, that's People would say, they're going to call me and say, you see that? Well, the, John, the John first, would champion white racist. The first thing I would do is look at who called him a white racist. If it's someone like Hilly, I won't even pay attention to it. You know, he said before, you're not black. You don't know what the experiences that blacks have had to go on through. I thought blacks were no different than anyone else, but if whites say they're different, he calls them a racist, and so would other blacks. John, do you have a job? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the next time that person asks me that... Oh, stop it. And I will stop be on. responding hey, to that other hater who called him this afternoon, that phony who sends you vicious letters, that maniac who goes around the dial and talks to her talk show hosts about how they should treat callers who he disagrees with. I don't know what you just said, so help me God. Yeah, I don't know Al from Queens, who called, he called Bob, Bob this afternoon and used a phony name. Did he? he call, Al from Queens called Bob today? Yeah, Mr. Adnoid, because he disagrees with my politics, and he told a lie about me, about a talk show host getting his show canceled because I said something on his show. That talk show host was on for four more months, and he had been announcing all along that he was going to discontinue Yeah, no, I heard. That's show. right. He, he, said, he said that about Farber. Yeah. yeah no, you're, you know something? You're right. Al from Queens, I think I heard that today, and I knew it was him. That's well, very interesting. Yeah. Barry that's had been talking for a long time of discontinuing his, uh, his show here in New York and going network. So once again, this guy lied because he doesn't like the fact that I can tell blacks well, off when they're listen, wrong, and he hasn't got the guts to because he's I, a pandering liberal. I don't know if it was really Al from Queens or not, but I have the funniest story. I know it was. I can't say it was Al from Queens. No, but this happened to me years ago. I was on the radio once, and I thought it was him. <laughs> You're laughing, but I, he, a guy sounded just like him. I don't know if it was really him, <laughs> yeah. but he, yeah, they, he broke he, down. Well, he, he, uh, he, well, he really didn't like you, see. <laughs> was that I was able to make a mimic him and make a fool out of him. See, that's what he really didn't like. <laughs> well, uh, um, but, you know, to get back to the vicious one, <laughs> you know, racists like Hilly don't follow uh, one person. They follow one philosophy, though. And by the way, he talks about you demeaning yourself, Jay. But when he call, he uses curse words on the air and has to be cut off, <laughs> that's, just, that's not no. demeaning he, yourself, he right? He explained that to me. He explained that to me. Yeah. That's that, called that temper. That's called doing the dozens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what he said. Yeah, doing the dozens. What, what did he say? Some Who's stupid say, catchphrase say, from the ghetto. Say it. <laughs> say And he talks about <laughs> Professor Levin. You say. know, Jay, Professor Levin, whoever he has debated on the subject of race, He's made an absolute fool out of because he had his hacks. And Professor Levin has also said that Asians are smarter than blacks in many cases. No, you smarter than white. Smarter than white. You didn't see whites out in the street demonstrating against him because they're not paranoid. Well, just, I'm just interested in one thing. What did he say about Jews? Oh. Levin. Levin? Yeah, where I don't did know he put he them on the... About Jews. That's the most important He's thing. Jewish don't you himself. understand? That's the... I know what Jeffries has said about Jews, and now Hilly's <laughs> trying to lie about that, too. Would you? 
You notice who G Hilly always tells us to who we should... Uh, if you say it in Hilly's voice, it'll register with me more. Nah, I, I, See, no, you don't I, I don't do believe it. in joking with this guy. He, uh, Gil Noble, <laughs> Bill Tatum, Al Sharpton, Kelvin Butts, Timothy Leary. These are people that we're supposed to pay attention to. I think you're Timothy Mitchell. Timothy Mitchell? What uh, did I Leary, Tim Leary, you said. Oh, no, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You must be on One LSD. And, you know, last night, guess, get, get a load of what Curtis said. He said it was all right for the communists to be involved in the civil rights You're movement. talking about my brother in solidarity. Yeah, yeah the, my bro the, the brother who tried to have me fired from my job took your job. <laughs> all right. Over, used the tapes from Bob's program to curse Bob out. <laughs> and now it. Bob is a big pal of his. Yeah. Bob went to Manelli. Stop. Listen, listen. Come on. We're, but all right. We're a team here. Yeah. He happens to... Curtis is my brother in solidarity. Yes, a tag team. Oh, stop it. <laughs> Listen to me. I, are you going to take those treatments with me? Those injections? I think I think we should both take them. I, 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 think I, you I, I, didn't, I didn't tell you, Jay, but I've been doing it all along because if, when I see the way that whites are compared in America today to white, to black, I don't want to be white anymore. You know, that's true. We could get some free government loans. That's true. I could, I could take those injections just long enough for me to qualify for some loan program, yeah. to get a mortgage or something. Yeah. Then I could change. What would the government do? You know, that's a pretty interesting question. What if somebody wanted, like, a minority contract where they have the set-asides, yeah. oh, and I did I that, I injected myself, I turned myself black just long enough to go in and meet Mayor Dinkins and get the, yeah. <laughs> get the contract. And then as I'm leaving with the contract, all right, I'm very happy to give you this contract to erect nine million city streetlights at three times the normal cost because you're a minority business. Gives me pride to give you this contract. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. It's nice to have the contract. I've got it in my hand, and as I'm walking out the door, I start to change back. Yeah, and Dinkin I... sees me. Hey, wait a minute. You're turning white. No, 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 it's just the lighting in here, Mr. Mayor. It must be the lights or something. Well, have you paid you... the electric bill this month? No, I don't think I have. But then again, I never have. And they've never dared turn it off. Why should they start now? Come back here with that contract. And that Guards, board. bring him to me. He tricked me into a contract. <laughs> You're not black. You did it with injections. <laughs> now, it's not the color. It's the philosophy with us. That's right. But, um, it, but here is the latest example of the plight of black people in America. A report in the Monday, December 5th, 1994 edition of the New York Post. You know, that, that white publication, see? That, that doesn't tell the truth. It showed that four out of the top ten money earners in sports were black, with two out of the top four being number one, and two, on uh, number one and two on the list, Michael Jordan being number one, earning $20 million in racist America a year, and Shanil O'Keel being number two, earning uh, $18 million. You don't know how it, you see, you don't know how it works. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, saber in hand, I was in the arena behind the escutcheon of Caller Joe. Now, you talk about throwing Christians to the lion. How about throwing uh, some unwary, about 55 or 60 unwary, predatory, man-hunting, rich man-hunting barracudas to Caller Joe? So that's what I did tonight. But actually... Um, Ginny Sale's a very charming woman, very pretty woman, and it wouldn't be tough for her to land a docile billionaire, I can assure you of that, but I don't think the same can be said for many of the other females who were jammed uh, posterior to posterior, and there wasn't really much room for wiggling out, you know, the hotel where this seminar was conducted, but Caller Joe was, was at his best, and uh, he sat there very attentively, and there were a lot of women taking notes. I noticed a lot of women with pen in hand actually taking notes so as to, to drink up the enlightenment pouring forth from Ginny Sales, who, as I say, could sell ice to, to the uh, Eskimos. Why I say that is because this is a woman of unique talent and charm and ability, and I... Uh, in fact, I was mystified why she was speaking to a room of only about 50 or 60 women when I could easily see her speaking before an audience of, of thousands because she is a very, very riveting public speaker. But more or less, it was just a seminar on how to get a man, any man, and um, 
as that was the case, Joe and I had to be rescued by the by a paramedical team so we could get out of there at about a, uh, a quarter to nine. But I actually finally did come face to face with the legendary caller Joe, Joe from Brooklyn, and it might be my privilege to have him call in later with his analysis of the evening just passed with Ginny Polo Sales and about 60 Barracudas, high eyes hungrily focused on her, eagerly drinking up her advice on, frankly, how to marry the rich. And she had a little shorthand there. She talked about, now, when you seek out your RN, see, oh, that's the other thing I didn't tell you. She hails from Arkansas, from Little Rock, I believe. So, <laughs> now, now, I don't, I'm not saying she's a con woman. Actually, she's a very charming, and as I say, a very gripping, riveting public speaker. I could have sat there easily till midnight and listen to her expound on the, the importance of the right personality, wearing the right clothes, and having the right name, and seeking out the right address, and all the other little subterfuges that, that go into the holy grail of finding a woman, an RM, a rich man. But it's just as John has already said. John has always theorized that what women are out for is money, and I was forced to concede, although I'm a romantic at heart, that judging from the premises tonight, where Ginny Sales held forth, and all the greedy eyes and hands moving quickly to her revealed wisdom as they marked down notes on paper, it did seem that this was at least a room full of women who were eagerly looking for the RM, that's rich man. And Joe and I, there, was, there were two other males that I could find in the room, was all the way, I came late, so I was, I was forced, yes, that's right, I straggled in late, Joe was already there with a beatific smile on his face as though as though finally he were being he were being assured by the fates that what he'd all along theorized was in fact sealed etched in granite as the immutable truth and so caller joe it seems to me has been vindicated at least on the basis of this room tonight and um there was another guy up there uh, somebody up in the front row i don't know if he was part of the the presentation but it was interesting the lady who conducted it, this Miss Sales, had her husband there, and at one point, the husband was summoned forth to demonstrate how to, how to approach uh, an individual, a rich man, with the correct body language. Now, this was the only thing that I, that I thought was actually bizarre about the whole evening, in that he was totally silent, and he walked up to the front almost like an automaton, and I began to make judgments. Nice enough fellow, but he, she said, well, now, come on up here and let me show all the ladies sitting here how you approach different people of different social status. Now, always bear in mind, you do not want to reveal that you all are socially inferior to the RM. So she says she showed that people approach somebody who they feel is wealthy in a diffident way, in a shy way, and she, she sucked in her gut. Not that she had to. She's a very slender, very attractive woman, and... And she demonstrated how somebody who feels socially inferior, somebody who feels on an equal social footing, and somebody who feels superior to somebody else responds with body language. But the, the peculiar aspect of this demonstration was that she asked, all right, now, my husband will come up. He just silently walked as though he had been possessed or maybe had a pod placed in him by an alien, and he never said a word. And he just stood there with a very odd body posture. I can't describe it to you. But it's as though someone else were controlling him from outside. It was as though he were a robot. And she stood there dancing around him, demonstrating different body postures to denote different states of confidence in oneself. While he just stood there for about five minutes, staring straight ahead as though he, he didn't exist, as though his will were completely sublimated into someone or something else. And I theorized, well, I, I couldn't help but thinking what their what their relationship looked like behind closed doors. And uh, something about house cleaning came into my, my mind. But then again, I, I, I'm just, that's just me. Uh, just a few other things before I get to the telephones. Well, open it up. No set topic. The world is your oyster. I would just like to encourage a, an atmosphere here where people feel comfortable to call up about anything that strikes their fancy. Hello, John. Hi, Jake. Hey, you're going to the crucible tonight. <laughs> well, tonight and every tonight and every night. Yeah, it's not different from any other night. It's always the same. Uh, the uh, the de I have disagree with you on two things. I guess I, I just attract a, a highly intellectual and very verbally 
proficient group of people. <laughs> hey, you had a good night in your bed, but uh, I disagree with you on two things, which I'll get to in a minute. But first, I wanted to uh, point out once again the desperate, as usual, uh, negative, worst-case scenario liberals are still at it. They're saying now, of course, uh, what Newt Gingrich and the Republicans are proposing is totalitarian and degrading. You know what's totalitarian and degrading, Jay? Murder, robbery, rape, having your home broken into and everything you worked hard for all your life taken in a flash. And these are the type of people who commit these crimes that liberals have let gotten get away with all these years and gone fast on them. And when the conservatives try to do something about crime, we were kind of mad. <laughs> now all of a sudden the liberals are concerned with everything the Republicans and the conservatives are concerned with. Look at Bill Clinton. His last minute middle class bill of rights. You know, oh, suddenly, after uh, he turned his back on that middle class that he wooed with a tax cut and uh, broke his promise. Yes, George Bush broke his promise, but it wasn't to get elected. It was because he thought in the long run with democratic tax cuts, it would help the United States. And uh, two other things, Jay. I, oh, the, the liberals always exaggerate the numbers to always make the United States look bad and uncaring. In a poll of homeless people in July of 94, 83% of homeless said they were alcoholics or drug addicts. And the year before, a study showed that there were approximately 350,000 homeless people in the United States, a far cry from the millions the liberals kept telling us were out there. The number of so-called poor and the number of civilians that are killed when we have to take a military action, they always exaggerate them. Also, a report released by the U.S. Commerce Department in late October of 94 showed that the number of Americans without health insurance totaled nine million not the 35 million that the left-wing clinton administration was trying to get us be to uh, believe one of the one of the american people going to realize jay that you can never believe anything liberals tell you especially when it looks as though they're losing then they really get desperate but there's two things that i disagree with you on number one rudy giuliani didn't have any principles when he uh, supported mario cuomo he did that for his own political well-being, because he knew that if George Pataki ran, with Pataki and uh, D'Amato in, in the, you know, in the high ground, he, his political career would be practically over. 